Japan's not-so-royal wedding. A princess goes through with her decision to marry a non-royal, giving up her title, sparking massive media scrutiny and a public outcry. What does the future hold for the world's oldest monarchy? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I am Hashim Ahal Barra. Royal marriage laws have drawn a lot of controversy in a number of monarchies. A recent union in Japan is no different. It's highlighted the pressure imperial women face after years of media scrutiny and public criticism. Princess Mako married her college sweetheart, Kei Komuro, who is not a royal. But Mako had to give up her royal title to do so. The former princess was never aligned to the throne because Japanese law does not give women that right. Many Japanese people say they think the laws should be amended to allow female members of the royal family to be in the line of succession. We'll discuss that with our guests shortly. But first, Priyanka Gupta reports. As a royal, Japan's Princess Mako didn't bow to criticism or intense public scrutiny about her marrying the man she loves. Instead, with a somber farewell at the doors of the imperial residence, the emperor's niece said goodbye to her family and her royal title. It wasn't a typical fairy tale Japanese royal wedding. Mako Komuro, as she's now known, and her husband Kei Komuro skipped the wedding ceremony and rituals, instead filing marriage papers before making a media statement. To me, Kay is an irreplaceable person, and for us, marriage was a necessary choice to live while cherishing our hearts. I love Mako. I want to spend my only life with someone I love. Until now, we have shared and encouraged various feelings, both when we were happy and when we were not. Princess Mako grew up in a royal system that heaps extra pressure on its female members. And her engagement brought an even more intense media spotlight, including around a financial scandal involving her husband's family. Doctors say she's still recovering from a form of post-traumatic stress disorder. But despite her personal struggles, public opinion remains divided on the marriage. <laughs> I am very much against those who are against this marriage and sincerely wish Mako to be happy. The most important thing is that she is happy in the future. The media coverage of this story was, it seems to me, exaggerated, and I feel sorry for her in that sense. But on the other hand, she had a symbolic status, a pillar of our country. She was a public figure. Japan's male royals can marry outside freely, but for women, it means forfeiting their royal status. Japan is also one of the few monarchies with only a male line of succession in a country that already ranks poorly in gender equality. The latest departure leaves the imperial family with just 17 members. Only three are heirs to the throne. For some, Princess Marco's tumultuous engagement is perhaps a missed opportunity to make symbolic changes to old traditions as the couple prepares for a new life abroad. Priyanka Gupta, Inside Story. Let's bring in our guests in Tokyo. Nancy Snow, she is Professor of Public Diplomacy at Kyoto University of Foreign Studies. From Chizuoka, Sijiro Takeshita, Professor of Management at the University of Shizuoka. And also in Tokyo, Farah Hasnain, who is researcher and writer at the Japan Times. Welcome to the program. Nancy, why is it in modern times, in a place like Japan, for a princess to choose a college sweetheart who is not a royal to be her husband, creates all this drama in Japan? And why does she have to go through all the ordeal? It, it really wasn't that dramatic at the start. I mean, these were two who fell in love early on when they were um, 
undergraduates at International Christian University, and they were scheduled to have a very royal wedding in uh, 2018, I believe, three years ago. But unfortunately, there was uh, tabloid media that uh, dug up some dirt on the family background of her fiance. And uh, in Japan, you have to acknowledge that you're not just even, I mean, she's a member of the royal family, but also he is somebody who has a, a background as a commoner that's going to come under uh, scrutiny. And also he, his mother had some money that she had to pay back and it just began to unravel so that they had to not only postpone the marriage, but ultimately have a very quiet wedding ceremony behind the scenes today and then have a prepared statement before the mm -hmm. press. And now they're going to move on to the biggest media market in the world, New York City, and they've asked to lead a private life as a young married couple. So all we can do is really wish them the very best. But the fact that she comes from the imperial mm -hmm. family is uh, adds so much gravitas to this because so many Japanese people really look at the imperial family as the, the soul of this country. Okay. Seijiro, uh, Princess Mako chose an outsider, a commoner to be her husband, and this suddenly created all the uh, media coverage about his mother's financial troubles, uh, su media reports su suggesting that he's not fit to marry someone from the imperial household. Is it because of the very nature of the imperial household that the Japanese are very keen on protecting the, uh, the house, or is it because of the conservative nature of the Japanese people that we're having all this drama about a princess marrying a commoner? Well, I think it's actually both, plus the fact that there are many people who still want to be a virtual peeping Tom in regards to this tableau-like issue. Uh, very unfortunate. Um, and the fact is that the most Japanese still consider uh, the royal family as a very strong symbolism of their identity. And uh, for that reason, many people feel that they wanted to have uh, a person who is extremely clean in their background. Uh, but again, the fact of the matter is, um, it's none of our business to, to start out with. It's two individuals who's getting married. But certainly, that is not how, you know, the surrounding media and those people who benefit from rocking the boat feel that way. And uh, unfortunately, has uh, resulted in a very much of a a dirt throwing type of issue as a whole and the question of the whole issue should have been about the human rights and how the royal family should fare from here onwards but certainly that is not the issue that people have been talking about they've been focusing on much more of a privatized issue on um, her fiance and herself etc uh, so I'd say the argumentation has really circled around tabloid-like issue mm -hmm. rather than looking at much more of a bigger picture. Farah, should we blame the media for the fact that a, a marriage who is supposed to be a happy event for the royal family ended up being just those pictures that we saw of Mako saying goodbye to her parents, her sister Kako, putting her into an embrace and then moving into the uh, marriage uh, office? Um, I think, honestly, it's a combination of several things, but first and foremost, I definitely think the media is kind of pushing the narrative a bit, especially the international media. Um, you know, for example, I keep seeing articles saying, like, Japan's biggest scandal with this commoner marrying Princess Mako, but honestly, if you talk to anybody who's actually Princess Mako's age, <laughs> um, including myself, nobody really cares. Uh, about who she marries or even her life, really. Um, I actually am a student at International Christian University. I've talked to my classmates and I've interacted with several Japanese people I know. Mm -hmm. And none of them even knew that the wedding or the press conference was today. So it seems to be a specifically niche topic to an extent. So I feel like 
what the media is portraying is not accurate an accurate portrayal of what the general population thinks Mm -hmm. um just a niche segment of it really um but yeah i remember um when the quote-unquote scandal broke out uh they were just obsessed over what k komuro was wearing so his pinstripe suit which he wore anyway to today's press conference which i'm happy about and his ponytail which he had when Mm -hmm. he was flying back so I feel like at this point, it's just being nitpicky and they're just trying to make a story. And I think it's very convenient that they're sensationalizing this event okay. when the Japanese House of Representatives elections are coming. Nancy, the dramatic exit of Princess Mako from the royal la- la- life invited many uh, media companies in Japan to draw comparisons with the British royal family, particularly Prince Harry and uh, his wife, Meghan Markle. How do you see the comparison, by the way? I think there's no comparison there because uh, Meghan Markle and Harry, they've really taken on uh, this embrace of Hollywood and uh, they've got all these deals, these mega deals. They sort of have it, they want it both ways. They want to have this private life and then they also want to really bank a lot. Uh, They live just outside of Los Angeles and Montecito and Oprah Winfrey is a neighbor. So they, this is a very different scenario because this young couple has said, we want a private life. We're not going to make mega deals. He's going to, he's already with a substantive law firm in New York City. We don't yet know what Princess Mako is going to do, but that's, again, I would agree it's their business and they're not going to take on a very public profile, at least if you can go by the few remarks in the prepared statement today. Uh, Clearly, Princess Mako even said that uh, her upset and her, you know, illness and her inability to really speak too openly today had to do with these, this libelous uh, coverage, this sort of incessant media coverage. So I think they would be pulling back. So Mm -hmm. the comparison to Harry and Meghan, who've been so public, That's just a useful hook in the media. I don't think it's uh, really that accurate. Seijiro, now that the princess is going to disappear from the public life in Japan, move to the US to live with her husband, do you think that this could be the moment for more contemplation of what's next for the chrysanthemum throne in Japan? Should the royal family reinvent itself? Because... Obviously, you can see that they are under mounting pressure by many people. Well, I would like to think that, you know, there will be argumentation or at least discussion about how the royal family or I would say the the way, you know, these, I would say, ministers are being run as a whole, um, which is excessively secretive and excessively conservative. Uh, The fact of the matter is, is that in this case, Uh, She could become now a commoner, but if, for example, a lady gets married to a Japanese royal family, then she would lose her right as a human being, Um, you know, if you join the royal family. I know it's something that, you know, sounds very strange, but it still remains to be true. But it's very, you know, very little talked about. And these kind of issues are the things that should have been talked about, but, you know, hardly anybody talks about it. They all talk in a very much of a tabloid uh, manner, um, as the two ladies have been expressing right now so far. Um, One example is that, you know, um, the the couple have basically declined to receive a one-time payment of one and a half million dollars. Uh, which again shows you that you know they really want to leave a private life, and at least in this case, she yeah. has the choice to do that. But you know, if it was the other way around, in other words, if it was a lady getting married to the royal family, she loses her right as a human being. So uh, <laughs> basic rights as a human. So you know, these are things that should have been discussed about. But you know, certainly, I haven't heard a whim about this at all. So, Farah, we're talking here about gender equality by the end of the day in a, in a place like Japan. And many people just were not expecting this to be happening in a place like Japan, which is one of the most financially, techn- technologically advanced societies in the world. Yeah, like while Japan is uh, one of the big G7 countries, it still has the largest, uh, one of the largest gender gaps in the world. 
Um, and uh, I remember uh, watching the Meghan Markle interview with Oprah a few months ago, and I did notice some parallels with uh, Mako, uh, Princess Mako. So, of course, um, in this situation, it's quite different. There's less of a nuance with race and um, attacks within the family compared to Meghan Markle's situation. But, you know, they did experience a, a certain level of trauma because they're always under the public eye and they always have to act a certain way. And as I was listening to the press conferences, she always has to speak very proper Japanese and has to uh, exert herself in a certain, express herself in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So um, I think uh, disproportionately women are under pressure to act that way too, if they're in royal families especially. Nancy, if you look back at the history of the imperial family in Japan, Empress Michiko, Empress Masako, Princess Taka, Princess Yuri in the past. They all had to go through huge pressure to produce male uh, heir to the throne or to readjust to this strict life within the imperial household. And those stories were always shrouded in secrecy because it was the royal family and therefore you have to be careful about those stories. Do you think that this could be the moment to give those people more voices to talk about exactly what they had to undergo to be part of the royal family. Yeah, I don't see it really going in that direction uh, because uh, we don't really know how this story is going to grow legs. I mean, this couple is planning to relocate to New York City maybe as early as next month. They're applying now for pass, uh, a passport. I mean, she is, Princess Mako, hasn't had a passport as a member of the, the royal family. But I wanted to just address the, the issue of sort of mental illness mm -hmm. or um, having challenges mentally, especially attached to women. And I think that it can be somewhat problematic if you um, characterize women, you know, living in a society like Japan where the gender equality gap is so wide uh, that they struggle so much. And this came out recently with Princess Mako being diagnosed with complex PTSD. I have no reason to really question that, but this often comes up that, that women suffer so much when they go under public scrutiny. And we've got to figure out ways to empower both women and men to uh, speak for themselves and to be able to find their voices so that they can get beyond just the what can be so quickly labeled as being a victim mm -hmm. as opposed to one who is is really able to find herself. And I would hope that now in this new life in New York that um, she, uh, Princess Mako, can start her own career, go into the arts and culture, and mm -hmm. we'll have to wait and see. But she may do it privately, and she'll do it her own way. The bottom line, though, I don't think that it's suddenly going to open up others to talk about the pressures that they were under. That's an added pressure to talk so openly about those pressures. See, Jiro, those laws traditional laws of the royal family are not only uh, are not only creating problems for women but they are creating problems for the dynasty itself to the point where the imperial household now is running out of male heirs to the th throne because when you look at the uh, 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 the male members we have you have the crown prince uh, uh, Kishino and then his son Hisahito don't you think that this could now lead to a profound debate about the need to reform the royal family to the point where they can bring about those branches of the royal family that were scrapped back in 1945 or to allow women back into the uh, household even when they get married to uh, uh, non-royals? As I've been saying, that is exactly where the direction of you know, the argument or debate should have gone rather than looking at these very petty issues of how the couple communicates or how they behave, uh, which is an important, you know, um, I would say, uh, um, part of creating identity. I, I totally understand that. But rather than pinpointing about these issues, they should have been talking about how the royal family's future should be, you know, um, changed. 
uh, as you say, physically speaking, um, obviously there is a problem and also um, their ideology is obviously, or people who support that is obviously outdated by decades. Um, if you look at, you know, um, for example, I haven't seen the cohort, you know, uh, analysis of this, but I think it would be very interesting if you make a cohort analysis. In other words, you know, how people perceive this or how people feel about this, depending on your age group. And uh, I think it would be very clear, there would be a clear differentiation between the younger generation and the older generation. And obviously, what we had to do was inherit the values of the younger generation as well, mm -hmm. which basically should have connected to issues that you were talking about. But again, I, it should have gone there. But unfortunately, the debate and argumentation and people's concern have been on a very low tabloid level. And we really haven't gone uh, above that so far. Farah, we're talking about a country where women now are taking up senior positions in the government, in the political parties, and vying to become uh, sooner or later prime minister of uh, Japan. Do you think that this is going to be the prelude to starting a real debate also about the need to give women the right to become in the line of succession to the throne? Um, I'm not sure if it will go as far as to let women join the throne, but I definitely know um, it will definitely start more conversations about gender equality for sure. Um, especially when referencing uh, the situation with uh, Princess Mako, I did notice um, on social media in Japanese, a lot of women began to talk about the double standards between uh, women and men and uh, uh, people of different genders um, and attaining uh, royal status and comparing that to you know promotions in the workplace. So uh, I do believe that the conversations are getting bigger and uh, there is potential for change. Nancy, Old dynasties usually don't embrace change quickly because they think that could be paving the way to uh, risky overtures to where the unknown. In the case of Japan, could this be the moment to start that talk about the need to have a modern monarchy or imperial household that is more receptive to the concerns of its own people? Japan really has no choice. Uh, the demographics are against uh, the country in terms of uh, the low fertility and the shrinking size of the imperial family. They're going to have to change. Now, the rate at which they change uh, may be more modest here. It's not mm -hmm. usually a radical change. But you have a Japanese people, a public, if they were listened to, there would already be a change in place. It's just that the imperial family can't make that change. It would have to come from the government, and the government skews to the far right, or at least plays to that constituency, many of whom are traditionalists and, and don't want any change, don't want women to take over the throne, even though that's in their history. Interesting. Uh, going back centuries. So it's inevitable, but it, the public will here is often ignored. Speaking of that public will, Sijiro, now, the, uh, uh, Princess Marco's father was reported to have said three years ago, I will give my consent only when the people of Japan give the consent to this marriage. Do, who do you think should change first, the royal family or the Japanese people? Both. I would say both. Um, obviously, uh, the marriage should be focused on the people who are getting married rather than the surrounding, you know, um, families or whoever. Um, so I think, you know, um, his statement itself already tells you how embraced, uh, you know, and how locked, you know, these people are. Um, quite unfortunately, partly because, you know, uh, the Japanese public as a whole has a very strong conservative nature. In fact, um, amongst all people in the world, we have the highest level of risk avoidance. It's not only the individuals, corporations mm -hmm. and organizations as well. So there is a tendency that people tend to stick to status quo and would not like to make, you know, quick changes. But this is particularly showing, um, you know, quite vividly in areas like royal family, a household. Normally, this story belongs to the fairy tales, but because of the very particular circumstances in a place like Japan, you have all this controversy about a princess who decides to 
marry her college sweetheart, but then people say you have to adhere to the traditional values of a nation like Japan, which is widely considered as one of the oldest dynasties in the world for the time being. Nancy Snow, Seijiro, Tashi Hita and Farah Hasnain, I really appreciate your insight. Thank you. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com for further discussion. Go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is AJ Inside Story from Mihash Mahbara and the entire team here in Doha. Bye for now.